first of all, it's a situation where people are right in what they say, but incorrect in what they fail to say. The things they are saying are largely right. It's what they're failing to say that is not right. I'll come back to that in a moment. Let's begin with one of its arch proponents, however, and I'm very sorry to say this. Walid Shubat has abandoned biblical evangelicism and gone into becoming an apologist for Roman Catholicism. He was one of the chief proponents of that particular view. Uh, we can no longer endorse Walid's ministry. As many people know, he was discredited on CNN. The Israeli government refuses to lend any credibility to what he claims about having to been a terrorist and so forth. He's out of the picture very much uh, within any kind of credible circles. Most unfortunate, he's an intelligent guy and he had potential, but we cannot endorse the way he's gone and the way he's been discredited both by a CNN and by the Israeli government uh, leads us to conclude that there's been a lot of embellishment, to say the least. Nonetheless, he's not the only one who pushed this view of the Islamic Antichrist. Elements of it have been shared by various people, including John MacArthur, interestingly enough, but also by other people such as Joel Richardson and others. Once again, I come back to the point. They are right in what they are saying. They are wrong in what they failed to say. Let's go back to the Roman Empire in the time of Jesus. In the time of Jesus, the Roman Empire was bordered on the east by the Armenian Empire, which notably embraced Christianity before the Roman Empire did. The Roman Empire was not the first empire to embrace Christianity. The Armenians were. And not only is there to this day an Armenian uh, sort of monophysite church and Armenian kind of Eastern Orthodoxy, they have their own version of it, but there is a strong evangelical movement among the Armenians. They had their own Azusa Street or their own Pentecostal style revival in the early 20th century. Uh, Damon Shakarian and the Christian uh, Businessmen Fellowships in America and so forth were founded by Armenian Pentecostals. So the Armenian Empire bordered Rome on the uh, northeast. On the direct east would have been Parthia. That is what was left over from the Persian Empire. But they remained a formidable regional power and they withstood Rome for 300 years. But Rome then extended from there, from what is today uh, Western Jordan and the Golan Heights, all the way down to the tip of of uh, Israel and even a, a northern slice of, of, of the area bordering with Saudi Arabia across the Sinai and all of North Africa to Morocco, to the Atlantic. Then it encompassed England. Although the Celts resisted the, the Romans, the British never conquered Ireland, Scotland, or most of Wales, or Cornwall and England, strong Celtic areas, fought the Romans to a standstill, as did the um, Persians, or the Parthenians, as they were called then. But everything else from the Sahara, the northern rim of the Sahara, to the Mediterranean, from the Atlantic to the Levant, that is the eastern area of the Mediterranean, around through the Near East, that is Asia Minor, Turkey, Lebanon, Greece, the Balkans, obviously Italy, France, which was then called Gaul, and Spain, Iberia, Portugal, and north, most of Germany, Switzerland, portions of Austria, a small portion of Holland, and then, of course, uh, small areas of Belgium and Luxembourg, but mainly then up to England, the northern border being York, where Constantine became capital. Uh, and Hadrian's Wall, which was above that, which bordered Scotland to keep the Picts and Scots from attacking the Romans. It was a huge empire by the standards of the ancient world. But as Daniel tells us, it had two halves, represented by two limbs or two legs, the Greek-speaking East and the Latin-speaking West. If we look at the Greek-speaking East today, apart from Greece, if you look at Turkey, at that time the Roman province of Asia, most of Turkey 
was Greek, part of Greece. It was Greek speaking. These cities we see, and these regions like Galatia and Pontus, these were Greek speaking areas. The cities of Ephesus and Antioch and so forth, these were Greek speaking cities. Down to the Syrophoenician area of, of Lebanon and, and uh, the area around Aleppo on coastal Syria, down to, to Lebanon. That was Syrophoenician, cities of Tyre and Sidon, where Jesus actually visited. That had a small Jewish population, but they were Syrophoenicians. They were descendants of the Phoenicians who intermarried with the Greeks. Then we had Western Jordan, the Golan Heights down along Western Jordan to what is today approximately the border of Saudi Arabia, across from the Sinai, and then extending east all the way to the Atlantic. Hence, probably apart from Greece and apart from Israel, apart from Greece and Israel, all of what had been the eastern half of the Roman Empire is today Muslim, is today Islamic. And in fact, there were even Islamic areas of the Balkans above Greece, which today they remain Islamic, such as Albania, at least nominally Islamic, and also into the former Yugoslavia, where you had the Serbs who were Greek Orthodox, the uh, Croatians who were Roman Catholic, but the Bosnians, not the Bosnian Serbs, but the Bosnians who were Muslims. Well, this is a big chunk of the, East, of the Roman Empire, most of it apart from Greece and Israel and Cyprus, and even an area of Cyprus is, is Turkish, um, is Muslim today. But not only that, the southern realm of the Roman Empire. When Rome conquered Carthage, North Africa became Rome South and remained that way for quite some time. The indigenous people of North Africa at that time were not Arabs. The Arabs invaded late, later. They were Berbers. And these were people who also embraced Christianity rather quickly, but were terribly persecuted by the pagans. Many of the church fathers, such as Tertullian, came from North Africa. But today, that is all Muslim. So what I'm saying is, the southern access of the Roman Empire is today Muslim. Most of the eastern half of the Roman Empire, apart from Israel and Greece, is today Muslim. Bearing in mind you have substantial Muslim communities even in Israel, and of course in Cyprus, which is about 85% Greek, but 15% Muslim Turkish. Then you have, into the Balkans, areas of the former Yugoslav and Albania, but massive Muslim populations in the cities of Europe, such as London, Birmingham, Manchester, uh, and Britain, and then the Banlieu in Paris and France, Brussels. Uh, many of the cities of Germany have large Turkish populations and more Arabs coming every day at the behest of Angela Merkel from places like Syria, etc. You have large Muslim populations in southern Europe. Hence, Islam is very much there. It is occupying almost the entirety of what had been the Eastern Roman Empire, the entirety of the Southern Roman Empire, and even has made major incursions into the Western Roman Empire. Uh, there is no doubt, as we've said many times, that the nations at the center of world events in scripture are at the center of world events again, and this is of prophetic significance. This is not only Israel, it is Egypt, it is Syria, that is, and Assyria, Iraq, it is Iran, that was Persia. These same countries at the center of world events in scripture are at the center of world events again. However, we also have the reemergence of a primordial reincarnation of the Roman Empire. The European Union began as a common market and has increasingly become political. As Daniel said, they will desperately try to make the iron stick to the clay. Europe is continually falling to pieces, culturally, economically, and politically, but they keep forcing it. Iron does not adhere to clay. You've got strong nations in Europe that are economically and politically powerful, such as Germany, Britain, Holland, countries like that, and you have very weak ones in Eastern and Southern <coughs> Europe. But they're still trying to make the iron adhere to the clay, as Daniel said. So the issue becomes, well, where will the Antichrist come from? 
Will he come from a reconfederated Roman Empire or will he come from the Islamic Empire? And when we read about the persecutions of the Antichrist, there's an emphasis on decapitation, on beheading. You can go on YouTube and watch what the Saudi Arabians do almost daily. And of course, we've got Western politicians, people like George Bush, who the Saudi Arabians carried around in their pockets saying the Saudi Arabians are our friends. You actually had a president of the United States claiming to be Christian, saying that a nation that beheads people for becoming Christians are our friends. That's how corrupt and evil our leaders are in the West. Just evil, evil men who are in bed with this religion of Satan that persecutes Christians and who murders moderate Muslims and who fund anti-Zionism and terror to try to destroy Israel. But that's George Bush. Every other American president has basically been in bed with them, including the present one. Now they're even pandering to Iran under the Obama administration. Well, this is quite serious and quite deadly. And it will line up in a conflict that the prophet Daniel speaks of and that the prophet Ezekiel speaks of. And it is setting the stage for even further conflicts spoken of in the book of Revelation and by the prophet Zechariah. So we come back to our question, where will the Antichrist come from? Will he come from this eastern realm of the Roman Empire, which now encompasses the southern realm of the Roman Empire, that is largely Islamic, or will it come from the western Roman Empire, which remains nominally Judeo-Christian, even though it's post-Christian, and where there is an increase in the Islamic population. Which half is he coming from? The people who say he's going to be an Islamic Antichrist, looking at the growth of Islam and the increasing importance of these nations in Scripture becoming important today, looking at that with a prophetic eye, they have a very good case, a very good case, including the descriptions uh, with the decapitations and so forth. They make a good case. We cannot ignore what they are saying. They are right in what they say but they are wrong in what they fail to say. Here is the issue. They take an either or scenario. He's either gonna come from the reconfederated Roman Empire of the West that had been the Western half, the Latin Roman Empire, or he's gonna come from the former Greek half that became the Byzantine Empire and then was largely taken over by Islam. Which half is he coming from? It's one or the other. It is not one or the other. It is both. Allow me to explain. In our book, Shadows of the Beast, which I would urge our readers to read, you can obtain it either in hard copy or through our catalog, or you can obtain it through um, Amazon or Kindle. Shadows of the Beast, we explain something. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars, resembling the vision of Joseph in the book of Genesis. And she was with child and cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were the seven diadems, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up. The word there is harpezo, raptured. And to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished 1,260 days, approximately half of the final seven years, the 70th week of Daniel's vision. But then we continue to read what happens after this baby is rescued and the woman escapes into the wilderness. The dragon saw he was thrown down to earth. That's Antichrist. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished, nourished for time, times and a half time. Again, three and a half 
lunar years. From the presence of the serpent, and the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. Now that resembles the language of the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24. Same wording in Greek. Those who were not on the ark were swept away with the flood. Direct connection. But then we continue. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured on his mouth. Remember, one beast comes from the earth, the other beast comes from the sea. The earth in biblical typology usually has to do with Israel, the sea, the nations, specifically the nations around the Mediterranean. Then it continues. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring or the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. You've got this dragon trying to kill the baby coming out of the woman. When he fails to do that and the woman is protected and the baby is protected, he makes war with the rest of her offspring. This is a pressure interpretation of Matthew's nativity narrative. A Jewish believer at the end of the first century reading this would have understood it as a pesher, midrashic pesher interpretation of the nativity. A pesher interpretation is where one historical event recorded in scripture prefigures or foreshadows another. The dragon wants to kill the baby coming out of the woman, and when he fails to do it, he goes and kills the rest of her babies. Herod wants to kill Jesus coming out of Miriam, Mary. When Jesus is protected, he goes to Bethlehem and kills the other babies, the male babies under the age of two. Somehow, the Antichrist here will behave in the character of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was not called Herod the Great because he was a great guy. In fact, he was a lousy guy. Murdered many of his own sons, among other things. Every Herod in Scripture in the New Testament that's recorded typifies the Antichrist in some way. Again, I would point you to our book, Shadows of the Beast. I couldn't begin to elaborate further in this format. He was called the Great because he was a prolific builder and impressed the Romans so much. Herod the Great expanded the Second Temple of Zerubbabel, building a retaining wall around the Temple Mount and filling it in. To this day, the Temple Mount, because of Herod the Great, remains the largest man-made plateau in the world. The Wailing Wall is simply the western retaining wall of what Herod built. Now, when he expanded the temple, he combined Greco-Roman architecture with Ezekiel's vision of the millennial temple. He wanted the people to think he was fulfilling the millennial age, the messianic age. He was putting himself in the place of the Messiah. He's a picture of Antichrist. He wants to prevent the coming of Christ so he could keep power, much the same as the Antichrist will try to preempt the return of Christ so he can keep power. Well, how will Antichrist do that? He'll do it in the character of Herod. Antichrist will make war with the woman, that is Israel, and the rest of her offspring, any Christians who are here after the rapture or who become believers after the rapture, how be it under terrible times, bearing in mind that believers at that time will not be in the same situation as now. Once the faithful church is removed, God turns his prophetic purposes back to Israel and the Jews. The age of the church is over. Be careful of people who are always talking about tribulation saints. That is mostly a lot of nonsense. Mostly. God turns his grace back to the Jews, and it's not really grace as we would understand it but he will have the woman protected. In any event, let's look further. Antichrist is obviously in the character of Herod the Great. What Herod did at the first coming of Jesus is a picture of what the Antichrist will do at his return. But look at something else, how it's describing him. On his head were seven heads with ten horns straight from the book of Daniel. 
It is plainly Antichrist. Seven heads, ten horns, the kingdom of Antichrist. Plainly. But it is in the character of Herod the Great. Let's look at Herod the Great. Herod the Great was an ethnic Idumean. Idumea was an area of central Jordan, basically Moab, that was converted to Judaism in the Hasmonean period after the Maccabees. They immigrated from Edom, from southern Jordan, the land where Esau went, <coughs> into southern Israel, Idumea, the Idumeans. This was Herod's family. Herod was born into an Idumean family. In other words, he was an ethnic Arab. Anthropologically and genetically, he was an Arab in the physical sense. In terms of physical anthropology, he was an Arab. But in terms of cultural anthropology, he was a Jew because he embraced Judaism as a religion of political convenience. So you have somebody who is, in terms of physical anthropology, Arab, but in terms of cultural and religious anthropology, Jewish. Hence, the Arabs considered him to be an Arab, the Jews considered him to be a Jew. But there's more. Herod was actually put in charge of the Olympics by the Romans. The Romans didn't consider him to be an Arab or a Jew. The Romans considered him to be an Arab. All of the Herodian kings were considered by the Romans to be Romans. All of them. Some of them lived and grew up in Rome. All of them. So you have a figure here. Who to the Arabs, he's an Arab. To the Jews, he's a Jew. And to the Europeans, he's a European. This teaches something major about the Antichrist. He will know how to be as all things to all people. Now let's understand what Islam teaches about the last days. Their eschatology is quite convoluted, but indeed fascinating when you understand it in light of biblical eschatology. They have many signs and many events, but among the most important are the coming of the Mahdi. They are waiting for the Mahdi, the 12th Imam. Now, Sunni and Shia sects of Muslims have different versions of the Mahdi, but they believe this Mahdi is alive, the same as we believe Jesus is alive. They think he came in the ninth century and he's hiding away somewhere and he's going to show up again. He's somebody who never died. Now, what we believe about Jesus, somebody who died and came to life, or more accurately, what we believe about Elijah and Enoch, men who never died, that's what they believe about the Mahdi. Iranian fundamentalism of the Shias in Iran is very much predicated on the expectation of the Mahdi's arrival. Their armies are called the armies of the Mahdi, the Iranian army. They use the emblems and the black uh, ensigns and flags and so forth of the Mahdi. But then the Muslims also have an antichrist called Jibril. Jibril, again, I wrote this book a few years ago called Shadows of the Beast. I suggest people read it. They believe that this was a false messiah who came on a donkey. And he's going to be the deceiver. In other words, as has been said by Arab believers, by people saved out of Islam, people who are Muslims who became Christians, particularly Arabs, have said repeatedly and accurately, they are correct in what they say. Our Christ is their Antichrist. And their Antichrist is our Christ. <laughs> the Islamic Antichrist is our Jesus, the real one. But our Antichrist is their Messiah, their Mahdi. Buddhists are waiting for the fifth Buddha. New Ages are waiting for Matriya. Christians are waiting for the return of Christ. Jews are waiting for the Messiah, having rejected the true one. Muslims are waiting for the Mahdi. Everybody's waiting for a savior to get them out of a mess. You just look at unfunded government debt and liabilities with pension funds and things like this. There's no way out. This will have political ramifications for the nations, economically and politically, not to mention the strategic and ethnic conflicts. There will be fear and anxiety among the nations, none of them knowing the way out, 
They will be desperate for a savior and Antichrist will show up. But he will show up in such a way as he will know how to be all things to all people. The Buddhists will have no problem. The Hindus, New Ages, Catholics, none of them will have any problem, either will Muslims or unbelieving Jews. And neither will the apostate church. He will come in the character of Herod, the seven heads, the ten horns, to the Jews, a Jew, to the Europeans, a European, and to the Arabs, an Arab. Everybody will be able to think he's one of ours. Well, let's go further with this. In addition to the Antichrist, Jibril, there is the Mahdi, but they also believe in a kind of return of Christ. They believe Jesus will come back and he'll die and be buried next to Muhammad. But they believe when he comes back, he'll come back as a devout Muslim and worship in Mecca, and he will destroy the Jibril, the Antichrist. <laughs> uh, that is the Muslim Antichrist. It's quite incredible what they believe. They think he will pay homage to Muhammad. Now this is what you have, and to the Mahdi. This is what you have now. You have a situation where the two witnesses of Revelation, be they Moses, Elijah, Moses, Moses Enoch, Moses, uh, the Apostle John, and Elijah, whatever, we deal with these issues in Shadows of the Beast. They are counterfeited in Islam by the return of Jesus, their Jesus, who is not our Jesus. They say Jesus will come back, but their Jesus is inferior to Muhammad. He's simply a prophet who is not the son of God. Now it's inscribed on the Mosque of Omar, the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount, Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget. In Arabic, it's a quotation from a surah in the Quran, God has no son. We read in 1 John, in the epistle, that which denies the father some relationship is Antichrist. Already you have a kind of abomination of desolation on the Temple Mount, which is a foreshadowing of the one that's going to come when the Antichrist sets up the image of the beast and so forth. It's already up there. But it's, it's a shadow of the one that's coming. God has no son. This is Antichrist. This is Islam. Likewise, Talmudic Judaism denies the divine sonship of Jesus. Antichrist is going to bring a false peace between Jew, Arab, and the West. Islam teaches this. Although it says the Mahdi is going to force all nations and peoples to submit to Islam or kill them, it also says when the Mahdi comes, he's going to make a peace treaty with Israel for seven years. It's incredible. It says the same thing that Daniel says, that there'll be the seven-year period and there'll be some kind of a peace treaty. But Islam is even more specific than Daniel. It says he will do it um, as a treaty for seven years. But of course, he will break it. Well, let's look at this. They're waiting for a Jesus. Not our Jesus, but they think it's our Jesus, who's not God's son, who never died on the cross. They think Judas died on the cross. Then you've got the Mahdi, the 12th Imam, and then you have the Islamic Antichrist, who actually is our Jesus, but they think he's Antichrist. Quite a scenario. How are you going to reconcile this? Well, the Antichrist is going to be able to reconcile it. Like Herod, he will be as all things to all people. He will be a European. He will represent the Roman Empire. He will personify a resurrected Roman Empire, the ten heads, I'm sorry, the, the seven heads and the ten horns. He'll be that. He'll be from Europe. At the same time, he will be from the Muslim Arab world. At the same time, he will be from the Jewish world. He will be as all things to all people. Hence, our friends who are talking about an Islamic Antichrist, where they're going wrong is saying it's either East or West. It's either from the Islamic world, a caliphate, or it's from a resurrected Roman Empire. It can't be both. That's where they're wrong. It can be both, and it will be both. He will be in the character of Herod the Great. Our brothers who are pushing this Islamic Antichrist line, essentially, 
are right in what they say. They are wrong in what they fail to say. They are correct in what they are asserting, but they flounder in what they fail to take into account. The picture is much more comprehensive than that, and the deception will be greater than that. Again, I'm not trying to plug my book, but if you want to delve into this subject further, it's in Shadows of the Beast. God bless. spoke concerning many false prophets and many antichrists that would come in the last days. He warned extensively about the advent of false Christs and false prophets. However, in the book of Revelation, he tells us of these two beasts, commonly referred to as the antichrist and the false prophet, although not specifically called that in Revelation chapter 11, who will come at the end of the age, the man of lawlessness, the Anthropon a nomon, as Paul calls him, also the son of perdition, as referred to by the Apostle John. There are many people who have been aware of this for some time and spoken and written of the Antichrist. From the time of the Reformation onward, Protestant reformers and those who followed them spoke of the papacy as an Antichrist institution and of popes being Antichrists, some even the Antichrist. But what does the word of God say about this person and his false prophet, these two beasts coming at the end of the age? Why was this amount of emphasis given if it was not something we were meant to know? There are some who erroneously maintain it doesn't concern us, the church will not be here, that we're going to be raptured before the Antichrist comes, but that seems inconsistent with what Jesus told us. Let he who has wisdom count the number of the beast. If those who have wisdom are the so-called tribulation saints, they wouldn't have wisdom. Because if they did, they wouldn't be here either. They would have been raptured. Something has to be reconciled here. Why are we told to know and count the number of his name? What does that mean? Does it relate to the practice of, of Gematria? Does it relate to something else? The scriptures tell us far more about the Antichrist than most Christians realize. The number 666 occurs multiple places in the scripture, multiple places. And each place it occurs, it indicates something about the man of lawlessness who is to come. Judas Iscariot being another character in point. He and the Antichrist are called the son of perdition with the definite article. Why does the New Testament describe Antichrist as being in the character of Judas. They went out from among us, but they were not really of us. Both of them being very much concerned with money and wealth, but the only two people who have ever been satanically possessed, not demon-possessed, but Satan-possessed, are Judas and the Antichrist. Of Judas, Satan entered him, as will happen with the Antichrist. Why does the number of the beast occur at least twice with backslidden Solomon? What does Solomon teach about the coming man of lawlessness? There are many, many shadows, types, people who prefigure the Antichrist and false prophet found throughout the text of Scripture. There are the obvious cases from the Apocrypha warned of by the prophet Daniel, such as Antiochus Epiphanes and his successor, Demetrius Soter, and others in addition to them. It's something that many Christians are fascinated with, but few Christians properly understand. How did the early church understand the Antichrist and false prophet? What did the apostles teach people to look out for? 
What should we be looking out for today? In the book, Shadows of the Beast, we deal with this crucial subject, how the identity of the coming Antichrist will be made known to the faithful church. We are told in 2 Thessalonians that the Episunagage are gathering together to be with Jesus by rapture and resurrection will not happen until the Antichrist comes. As we get closer to that time, many Christians are coming to see this. Even people who had traditionally been pre-tribulational are now, if not amending, certainly redefining their views concerning the Antichrist. Although I disagree with him on many things and I'm not pre-tribulational, Chuck Missler now acknowledges the Antichrist will have to be identified before the rapture takes place. So does Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Again, these are people from a pre-tribulational camp of thought concerning the rapture. Even in that camp, people are beginning to realize we need to take 2 Thessalonians quite literally. Well, I've always taken it literally, as have other people in our ministry. It's a question that is inescapable. The rapture will not happen until we know who this person is. We must know. How will we know? What does the Word of God tell us? We've dealt with many characters in this book, not the least of which is Herod the Great. Why is the Antichrist so associated with Herod the Great and his image and imagery surrounding him in the book of Revelation chapter 12? Again, most Christians don't think in these terms, but we have a direct link between Daniel and Herod and Herod and Antichrist. It is absolutely vital that Christians begin to think in these terms and understand these things in the manner the early church would have understood them, having gotten their doctrine from the apostles. That is what we attempt to do exactly in Shadows of the Beast, how the identity of the coming Antichrist will be made known to the faithful Christians in the last days. Shadows of the Beast.